Food comes from life, and treating life as an industrial process is a mistake. In this episode, we're going to address how life is different from manufacturing. What are the hidden costs of treating life as an economic asset? And don't worry, I'm not going to really focus on animal agriculture, which is truly grim. I just thought the piglets were cute. We will briefly touch on pigs in a very positive light later in the episode. And finally, how can we respect our food sources as ecological beings and apply these insights to city design? As a former grower, builder, cook, and current permaculture designer, I've got you covered. Welcome to Edenicity, Best Practices for Sustainably Abundant Cities. All right, how is life different from manufacturing? Say you have an iPhone and a friend who doesn't have an iPhone. Not to worry, you just break off a few little pieces of your iPhone, give one to your friend, who then plants it in the ground, it sprouts, and a few months later, your friend's whole family has all the iPhones they need. This is, of course, exactly not how manufacturing works, but it is how life works. For example, if I have a bell pepper, I can eat the bell pepper, and there's enough seeds inside to share with all my neighbors so that in a few months they can have all the bell peppers they want. In this sense, life is abundant. It regenerates, it heals, it reproduces, and it recycles itself spontaneously. And it does all these things because life is part of a vast community that's been improving itself for billions of years. In other words, life is ecological. Manufacturing, on the other hand, is focused on producing scarce goods. Now, I like iPhones, but making an iPhone requires scarce resources. And when my iPhone reaches the end of its life, way too soon, it's very hard to recycle every component of it down to the microchips. Because manufactured goods are scarce commodities, they have lots of monetary value. In other words, they're economic. Now I know some of you are urbanists and you've read Jane Jacobs who said something along the lines of economics is a subset of ecology. But from my view, and I will quantify this in a few episodes, it's a very, very tiny subset. You'd be surprised. The differences between economics and ecology are so profound and so numerically vast that they are qualitatively quite different. If you open any introductory economics textbook, for example, the very first chapter will define economics as the study of scarcity, or to be more precise, the allocation of scarce resources of materials, time, energy, and knowledge. But when you look at an introductory ecology textbook, it doesn't mention scarcity. Instead, it says, ecology is the study of how living beings interact with each other and their environment. Now, in my view, this is a very conservative way to describe ecology. It's kind of like saying a clock is something that moves. But in my view, if economics is the study of scarcity, ecology is the study of abundance. That is to say how living beings collaborate with each other and their environment to make a world that's more alive. Now, because these definitions are almost opposite one another, can you see how treating food in strictly economic terms requires the introduction of scarcity to something that is fundamentally not scarce? The obvious example is seed patents. There are companies that have developed seeds over the course of years, and in order to recuperate the costs of those plant breeding programs, the seed companies need to restrict the distribution of the seeds in some way. In other words, they need to introduce scarcity. To me, this is kind of funny because the vast majority of plants, including all of the major plants, such as corn, that we depend on, were developed hundreds to thousands of generations ago in non-monetary societies and distributed under the laws of abundance rather than scarcity, which is one of the reasons we have tens of thousands of highly palatable varieties of food that have been optimized for our nutrition today. But okay, that's pretty much a legalistic perspective. What about the physical, ecological view of industrializing food? Well, two examples come to mind. The first is economies of scale. When you see a huge combine going through a giant field of corn, you know that combine costs a lot, but the field is so huge and the combine's going through it so quickly that it's saving an enormous amount of money on labor. One of the ways to optimize this situation economically is to grow just one kind of food at a time. In other words, to monocrop over a large area so that you can plant it quickly, tend it quickly, and harvest it quickly. This does increase productivity and lower cost, but there's a catch. Our second example is economic optimization. Different areas of the world are better at growing different things. When you work out the details, it's economically efficient for each area to specialize in the crop to which it is best suited. And again, this pushes things in the direction of monocrops. In this slide, for example, we're looking at a palm oil plantation in Indonesia, which is no doubt displaced a very much more biodiverse jungle. But again, there's a catch. 
What's the catch? There's hidden costs to monocropping. Basically, it's been an ecological disaster through and through. The problem with monocropping is that it takes what was once a home to a very large number of species and makes it a home to just one species. And when this happens, you lose the enormous number of services that those species provide, not just sometimes to the crop itself, but also to the soil and the overall environment, even the climate in which that crop resides. You lose the foragers, the predators, decomposers, nitrogen fixers, dynamic accumulators, and in field crops at least, the condensation drip from trees and the groundwater that that helps to preserve. When this happens, crops require more irrigation, pesticides, fertilizer, and herbicides, as well as tilling, which in turn wipes out 99% of the soil's biodiversity, that is to say, the microbial life that's holding the soil together. That in turn causes the soil to lose most of its fertility and structure, causing severe soil erosion, and in some cases, salting. In his book, Dirt, the Er erosion of civilizations, David Montgomery points out that since 1945, modern agriculture has severely damaged 1.2 billion hectares of soil. That's an area the size of China plus India just since 1945. Not coincidentally, we've lost half of the world's living biomass in that time, including 90% of wild mammals. Now, it's not entirely agriculture. Agriculture accounts for a little over 70% of human land use, but it's a really big part of the picture. Okay, so let's look at how we can do a better job respecting our food sources as ecological beings. Here are three examples. The first is sun-grown coffee. Now, I know coffee barely qualifies as a food crop. It's mainly a cash crop, but it does displace at the very least subsistence food crops in many areas of the world. Now, sun-grown coffee requires costly fertilizer, irrigation, and weeding. And in full sun, coffee plants live only about 20 years. This is because coffee is basically an understory plant. Grown in shade, it lives 60 years with minimal inputs, but it yields only half as much per acre. What if we design a food system around coffee that respects its ecological niche? The question is, would such a system be economical? This 2021 study looked at three farms in the central highlands of Vietnam. One was an organic shade-grown coffee farm that had been recently established, and two were nearby sun-grown coffee farms using conventional techniques. The paper not only reported on its original research, but also did a really nice job reviewing and summarizing prior work in this field. So it was able to provide an exhaustive list of benefits to growing coffee in the shade. The main benefit was more predictable, stable yields, because in the shade of overstory trees, the soil temperatures are much more stable, and the shade trees provided habitat for a diverse range of native pollinators, which meant that more of the berry blossoms bore fruit. The overstory trees also provided an expanded bird habitat, and some of the birds ate the coffee berry borers, so there was less need for pesticides. Shade-grown coffee also enjoyed better water security, first of all because of condensation from the overstory trees. Condensation is often one of the most important forms of precipitation, especially in humid areas. With this extra irrigation drip, the soil stays is moist, and the trunks and root systems of the trees store and buffer floodwaters, and with the moist soil they're better able to weather droughts, all of which means less need for irrigation, and less risk of erosion and landslides. Now, how do these translate to better design? The shade-grown coffee farmer built what's called a food forest, where many of the overstory trees were edible. These edible tree crops included macadamia, jackfruit, guava, and banana. These, plus ground crops, fed the family and their farm animals. In fact, the animals were able to eat many plants that the family couldn't, making more nutrition available to people from the environment. The animal manures also provided an organic fertilizer, vastly reducing the need for imported petrochemical fertilizers. Now the question is, did this design make economic sense? In a word, Yes. The net return was three and a half times more than sun-grown coffee. Let's break this down. The organic coffee did get higher prices, like three times higher prices per pound. The yields were 40% lower, so the organic coffee earned 44 million Vietnamese dong compared to 22 million Vietnamese dong in the full sun farms. But notice this. Even if the coffee crop had failed completely, the other shade farm products still brought in more income than the sun farm. Now, reading from left to right, the fixed costs of the shade farm were much higher than the sun farm because they had to bring in trees and animals and animal feed and animal pens. So that added up to twice the variable costs that both of the farms had. The total input costs of the shade farm were about three times higher than the input costs of the sun farms. But again, the total income 
was so much greater, then it more than made up for it. And then it returns again were three and a half times greater. So this is really an example of how when you pay attention to ecology first, it does not necessarily harm the economy. In fact, in most cases, it helps it. And to readers of Jane Jacobs, this would not be a surprise. All right, let's look at another example. This is in northern Senegal, where the Sahara Desert has been threatening to leap over the Senegal River and spread into the Sahel. You can see that in places it's done this, and two years earlier, the area shown in the large picture was a complete desert. But they were able to bring it back by digging these biomass trenches. These are little half moons that they dig in the ground and then plant up with really high fiber crops such as sorghum and then slash those down to absorb rainwater, which provides a moist environment for the trees in the dry season. This is part of a series of videos by Andrew Millison that are just amazing. You should check it out. Uh, see the link in the description. But in this case, by interacting with the physical environment to catch and store or rainwater, they were able to establish, again, a diversity of plantings that would benefit each other. This is all part of a larger effort called the Green Wall of Africa, which is aimed at halting the spread of the Sahara Desert further south. One of the innovations of this program is to put together cropping systems that keep the soil covered most of the year, rather than leaving it bare for large chunks of time as is the case when they grow millet. The idea is to plant a food forest. So the main tools here are fences and a diverse set of trees that are planted in a correct successional sequence so that each prepares the soils and the environment for the next trees and the next crops to be planted. Here's what that looks like on the ground. This is just two years into the system. And in the large picture, you can see what looks like papaya growing in the food forest in an area that is probably at least 10 degrees Celsius cooler than the adjacent areas. In one of his videos, as Millicent points out that people like to hang out under the tree canopy because it's up to 10 degrees cooler than the surrounding areas. In the inset, you can see the difference between the food forest and the surrounding area, which is planted in monocrop. This is proving to be a really good deal for the local farmers because before, if there was a drought and the monocrop failed, which happens more and more with desertification, they would have to endure economic famine. But with the food forest, they're able to feed their family no matter what happens to the big cash crop. And they're finding that the crops in that tiny fenced area are so productive that they're bringing in extra incomes and their children who were previously having to go overseas as far away as Spain to look for work are staying home because now there's enough money to be made in agriculture at home. And again, I want to emphasize this is a large scale project across several countries involving many, many thousands of families and hundreds of thousands of hectares of plantings. And again, it's just awesome to see in the videos. I highly recommend it. But what about cooler climates? Well, in Austria, Sepp Holzer has converted what was previously a spruce monoculture mountainside into a really diverse farm with ancient cattle breeds and traditional grains. The secret to his success? Earthworks again. Even in this cool, somewhat more humid environment, his first move was essentially the same as we saw in the Sahel, digging earthworks to capture and store rainwater in the landscape. In this image, I count anywhere from eight to ten ponds, depending on how you count the boundaries. That's about a fifth of the total number of ponds on his farm. There are several videos about his work that are all very good, but I think he is uniquely qualified to tell his own story, and he's done so in his book, Sepp Holzer's Permaculture. Yeah, he basically reinvented permaculture on his own, and it does parallel a lot of what Bill Mollison's permaculture talks about. His prose is fierce and poetic, and always full of surprises. I can't recommend it highly enough. Now, the success of these ecological farm systems is so impressive that you might be wondering why people would even choose to live in cities when these alternatives exist. Let me take a moment to remind you why the world's urban population is likely to grow by 2 billion people by 2050. People choose cities for work opportunities, whether it's to find jobs, venues, materials, investors, or customers. Cities are where most of the world's businesses and where a good chunk of the world's manufacturing is conducted. Cities are social engines. These are places where you can meet people who share your interests, where you can make friends, and even start a family. Even with today's online world, cities offer unparalleled opportunities for education. With libraries, colleges, universities, trade schools, museums, arboretums, and maker spaces that engage not just all of the senses, but our bodies as well as our minds in collaboration with other people. Cities are centers of culture, the arts, entertainment, activities, sports, dining, and of course, shopping. And finally, cities are where you go for high quality medical care, hospitals, doctors, dentists, trainers, geriatric care. If you tried to disperse all of these functions of the city out into the countryside, it would be ruinous to the natural ecology. And outfits such as strong towns 
have shown how the attempt to do this with suburbs has basically been a Ponzi scheme. But the key to having a successful city is to have an abundance of housing, efficient transportation that works for everybody, and I would argue to have good quality, organic, ecologically sourced food, as well as renewable energy and a high quality commons. So these would be places like parks and waterfronts, as well as places like libraries. The other thing that cities have the potential to do is to vastly reduce the sprawl that has destroyed so much habitat and wiped out so much living biomass on the planet. And the best way to make cities more space efficient is to start applying the principles of ecological design to cities. All right, so how do you build an urban ecosystem? The place to start is the earthworks. You want to grade the land to catch, direct, and store water so that you can supply your needs locally rather than having to build massive reservoirs in the wider watershed. The way you do this in the city is by building creek beds on contour with natural borders that catch runoff from hard surfaces. Creeks naturally go downhill. So what I'm talking about is kind of artificial and it runs perpendicular to the flow of the creeks. That's why the shape of Edenicity in an almost flat landscape would be kind of rectangular. You have the direct downhill flow of rivers and creeks, and then you have the additional catchment provided by the city on contour that intersects it at right angles. Now, along these contour creeks, you want to plant trees to buffer floods, to take up floodwaters, and thereby also recharge the groundwater, which protects the city against droughts. The contour creeks, of course, connect up with those reservoirs, lakes, and rivers, helping to maintain a high-quality local water supply. This then forms the backbone for a layered tree canopy throughout the city. You'd want to forest the hills to control erosion, and within the city, intersperse orchards with gardens and row crops with browse and pasture for many beneficial plant-animal interactions. And yes, this would all happen within the city. If we design cities by getting rid of cars, we free up enormous amounts of land for these other uses, while making everything much more compact and close at hand. As explained in the Edenicity reference design, see the link in the description. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about how this would work, have a look at these videos. The top one talks about all the additional benefits of urban agriculture, why we should actually grow food in the city. And the one on the bottom is a brief overview of how to design a sustainable city. So this is the end-to-end -end walkthrough of the Edenicity reference design. And since you're still with me, me, if you want to turn scarcity into abundance in cities, please be sure to leave a like and share this channel with as many of your friends as you can. Take care, stay green, see you next time.